It's not every day that I get to talk about the birth of a new DVD and Blu-ray label, so this is a very exciting occasion for me. We're talking about Film Masters, a brand new label uh, company dedicated to the preservation, the restoration, and the celebration of, of cinema. We're, their goal is to bring as many films that have fallen off the radar, that have slipped through the cracks, that have not been given the attention and the love and the restoration work that they deserve into the modern boutique marketplace. Uh, the first three titles have already been announced. We got the giant Gila monster or Gila monster uh, from 1959, coupled with the killer shrews on a double feature. We've got Beast from Haunted Cave on a double feature with Ski Troop Attack. And we've got the 1934 version of The Scarlet Letter. So the idea of those movies preserved from the best surviving elements, from film elements, uh, from personal archives and from different places, from, from libraries, uh, and then restored you know, at great cost is tremendously exciting for me. Also, the added value of extensive special features. They have announced uh, collaborations with Daniel Griffith's Ballyhoo Motion Pictures with C. Courtney Joyner, my friend. I did a commentary on uh, Boris Karloff's The Man They Could Not Hang with Mr. Joyner. Sam Sherman, uh, Jason A. Nye, Tom Weaver, Larry Blameyer. It's going to be absolutely incredible. Rather than me just telling you what Film Masters is going to be, uh, I went to the founder of the company. So we're going to talk to Phil Hopkins. I have an interview you're about to see with Phil Hopkins, who is also, he, he's the founder of the Film Detective. If any of this sounds familiar, if you, this, this sounds kind of like Film Detective releases, well, that's not a coincidence. We're going to get the story from Mr. Hopkins himself. This was a joy. Uh, I'm tremendously excited about what's happening with film preservation right now. With these, as a genre movie fan, there has never been a better time for film preservation uh, for the boutique Blu-ray marketplace. This is, it's, there's no other word. It's exciting. We are watching something happening. We're seeing a shift. We are seeing a movement happening right now as all of these film geeks, these film collectors, these film buffs and cinephiles like me, like you are able to save movies. So without further ado, let's hear from Mr. Phil Hawkins, the founder of Film Masters. The, the first question I want to ask you is, you're, you're launching a new label right now in a very interesting time for home media. Um, are you, is it, is it daunting? How do you feel as you're entering in this new enterprise? It's weird. I mean, it's actually kind of, I feel like almost similar to what happened with vinyl records. Yes. There were a couple people doing it and then all of a sudden it shifted and a ton of people got into limited edition vinyl 180 gram reissues. And then the vinyl industry had a massive resurgence. They overtook CD sales. Mm -hmm. I think the same thing's happening with this sort of awakening of better looking film through scanning in a higher resolution and making stuff available. And there's so much that's out there that hasn't been converted to 2K, 4K, and it's not going to happen with one boutique label. And I think in the landscape too, there's always people that sort of lean on stuff they like for genre. And then there's stuff that falls through the cracks that a lot of people probably wouldn't see value in spending a lot of money putting a 4K version out. So that's the that's the weird sort of scenario is, you know, choosing the titles and then making the judgment call uh, and saying, is there a large enough audience, you know, to to support the release, even if it's a limited edition? Um, but there's just it, it there seems to be a lot of energy in the past couple of years ever since we started, you know, going back to when I started 20 years ago with just releasing standard definition DVDs. Mm -hmm. That was a different, that was a mass merchant thing. You had big box retailers just taking, you know, a whole amount of stuff that they couldn't get fast enough. And then when big box closed and we really get into more sort of strategic online, uh, that's when you started seeing the renaissance of the films getting deluxe editions with commentaries and special features. And we kind of honed in on that uh, and said, if we're going to do it, we've got to just do it really well and make as much of an investment in the people that are doing the editorial, the commentaries, the special features, 
And this way you have a somewhat definitive experience. Doesn't mean it, it can't get better, but at least it's better than the previous one. Well, you, you talked, so before we get into film masters, I do want to ask, and you just mentioned when you started 20 years ago, we should talk about the film detective and all of the preservation work that you were doing there. This is sort of an extension of something you've been doing. This isn't a new thing for you. You've been doing this for decades. You've been a film preservationist, an archives, dare I say, a collector for, for decades now. Yeah. I mean, it, it, when you are obsessed with something and then hopefully your passion turns into your career, that's the best case scenario. Um, and, and, and for me, yeah, that was, I was really lucky. I get into a home video almost sort of not even realizing you could monetize 16 millimeter film prints onto a different format. Uh, and this was around the time when you'd go to a convention, you go to Chiller and people were selling Coffin Joe VHS tapes for 30 bucks mm -hmm. because you couldn't get them. Right. So just, just the availability of a lot of deep catalog genre films. Uh, if you go back to, you know, something weird video or sinister cinema, uh, those two companies back in the eighties were putting out titles that were so obscure that you, you would never find them in any mass merchant retail store. That's really the boutique label, the birth of the boutique label, companies like that. And they really started this whole initiative where genre film became a thing to put you know, into a better format like Blu-ray and Ultra HD. If you, if you go back to the 80s and early 90s, if you ever went to some of those collectible shows and um, nostalgia shows, everything was the best you could get it. If you wanted a Bela Lugosi film, a monogram mm -hmm. you were going to buy that at your local department store on vhs right. you'd get it from a collector who made his own transfer probably on an elmo 16 millimeter projector well i noticed that the uh there's a trailer for for film masters on youtube but we should encourage people to go over to the youtube channel and follow it um and i'll link to it in the description of this as well but it says preservation restoration celebration I think I, I really love that because that is it, it's tapping into it is the enthusiast market. You know, you're, you're not trying to reach the casual big box customer. You're trying to reach the film fan who's really the cinephile, the movie buff, the people who are interested in deeper cuts. And that seems to be the I don't know. Will you tell me if you agree with us or not? I feel like that's the future of home media right now. But as streaming starts to dominate a certain field, the niche, right, that's this is an opportunity for for people like you to celebrate that niche collector marketplace. Oh, oh, definitely, without doubt. I mean, if you look, even equate it to radio, there's left of the dial. We have a, all the college radio stations are playing mm -hmm. experimental music. Then you have right of the dial, which is your top forty mainstream. So that's a great analogy, right? You know, it's it's become uh, niche, and it's I think it's going to translate to uh, with streaming. You'll see more streaming channels that are sort of specializing in genre, and they'll maybe sidecar what they're doing with home video. We plan on it probably in 2024 uh, to partner up with maybe three or four other libraries or even a major studio and try to come up with a well-curated, well-programmed streaming channel that's not just static videos. I think the, the reason Turner Classic Movies is so successful and there was such an outpouring of anger when they threatened to lay off virtually everyone that made that special and made that you know curation and programming and going into things that would never get into mainstream you know media otherwise because right. those individuals who work with archives and the film you know preservationists and the editorial team that actually understands how to contextualize these things that's lacking in streaming you don't see that, you know, sort of deep engagement with contextual tools to, you know, introduce an audio commentary to a film. So I think the future, as we get into streaming and, and sort of using that as a tool to promote the physical, is you're going to need to do more of the programming that includes bringing in editorial teams and commentaries and special features into the streaming environment. And I think that will, you know, sort of allow us to grow a larger footprint because uh, right now the streaming experience kind of is lame when it comes to genre films. There's really nothing out there uh, that I can look at and say, oh, that's that's being done really well, and they've got 
deep curation and they're programming it really well. It's just a bunch of films that they're static and you go through a Roku device or you go through your television and you just see these static films without any context. So it's hard to get a younger person or even a younger audience inspired to watch that stuff if it's not exciting and energetic. Can you talk to me a little bit about the, the term preservation is used a lot. I feel like a lot of times it's misused by people who say, I bought such and such because I want to preserve it. Well, they're preserving it for themselves. But what you're doing is something very different. What, what is involved in film preservation from your level? Yeah, so there's film collecting and there's film hoarding. And then there's preservation, which actually includes working with institutions and getting people to donate large sums of money to make new photochemical prints that can be used for preservation purposes. So UCLA uh, Television and Film Archive is all about preservation. If you look at what they've done over the years, they actually make new 35 millimeter photochemical prints to preserve so they're available for screening or for educational use. And sometimes it takes working with individuals who have things in storage, they're overseas. I mean, just the work that goes into finding elements and then making a new preservation print is incredibly costly, but also arduous because you don't always have great material. Uh, we're putting out a film in conjunction with UCLA in November uh, that's owned by Sam Sherman, the a uh, wonderful mentor of mine who worked for many years with his partner, Al Adamson. Uh, but he loved the film, the 1934 film, The Scarlet Letter. And that's never come out as a decent version. It's always been low res sort of 16 millimeter dupe prints. So we were very fortunate that Sam, who when he was a young guy in the 60s, he ended up acquiring the rights to a lot of the Majestic Pictures films. And the original camera negative is still available. And that was what was used to make the preservation print. And ultimately what we used to scan, make the 4K scan for the release. So that's the best case scenario. And it's unusual when you get into poverty row studios like Majestic to actually have an OCN original camera negative for a film like that. So that's a huge win. Um, but that's really kind of the detail in terms of preservation. Um, you're making something new off of something old, and then you're preserving it for generations and different use later in life. I want to, because you have been doing this for so long, I, I've been watching online uh, some of the talk around film masters and people are saying, I've, I've seen people say, this looks a lot like the film detective. You're the founder of the film detective. Could you connect the dots here for people? I am. So Film Detective was sold several years ago. Um, we ended up selling the company to another media company. I took a year off, um, missed what I did, missed the people I worked with. And I was at a point where I was ready to get back into it. We had a couple of um, major things happen um, that were catalysts. Uh, my good friend Wade Williams passed away, who I was working with for several years releasing uh, his library onto Blu-ray uh, and, and restoring a lot of films in conjunction with the folks over at Paramount uh, who are wonderful preservationists. So we had a good thing and a good cadence and then sadly he passed away and I realized you know there's a lot of work with people like Wade Williams, my friend Sam Sherman, that have original camera negatives, very important fine grains, in some cases nitrate, and they're not in great safe locations. They're kind of uh, in challenging locations or they're not really accounted for. They might be in someone's basement or a storage locker or overseas somewhere. So I kind of decided that while I'm still into it enough to want to do this, to try to bring as many films that are potentially in harm's way mm -hmm. into institutions so we can not only get them to be taken care of by good custodians, but we can also get them back into the world as better versions. Uh, we started doing that and you know, I made the decision to sell for a reason. Um, sometimes you look back, hindsight's 2020, but I did really miss what I did uh, with the team I worked with. So um, Film Masters is more of a 
sort of collection of the individuals we like to work with, whether it be editorial for contributing to our blog or editors or documentary uh, filmmakers who want to take a subject matter and then do something that relates to either a theme or one of the Blu-rays that we're working on. And that's really, it's a collection of a lot of my favorite people and a lot of film lovers and we're just getting started. So a lot to be discussed within the next few months as we sort of make exciting announcements on some pretty major releases. Well, already uh, the the people that you've announced that you're collaborating with is we got Larry Blamar, we've got Daniel Griffith, Bally. Yeah, two interviews right here on my channel with uh, with Daniel Griffith about Ballyhoo. Uh, my friend C. Courtney Joiner, who is uh, class act all the way. Jason A. Nye, uh, Sam Sherman, who you mentioned, Tom Weaver, and others. I mean, that's that's the A team. You've got and and the the track record is there, right? Because we've got previous um, contributions from a lot of those guys on. Uh, releases that you worked on in the past and I know just Daniel Griffith is one of my absolute favorite documentarians because I know for a fact how much he loves this stuff and the detail that goes into his his features and his documentary stuff he told me one time he said they're not I don't view them as special features they are the main attraction for me he puts everything into those and I think that shows they don't feel supplemental they feel like they're substantial they're weighty you know what I mean Oh, totally. I mean, I think what Daniel does is on a, such a large scale of, you know, perfection because he he hones it to the bone. He's got it down. Mm -hmm. And as an editor, as a documentarian, as just an all around good guy um, who loves this stuff and his, his level of knowledge for someone his age. I mean, you know, I can understand someone like Tom Weaver, who's been around a little bit longer, uh, right. but Daniel is not really, you know, an old guy at all by any means yep. is the goal really one release a month one dvd blu-ray re release every month yeah that's the plan right now um it's and again that's even challenging we'd like to do more but as you just mentioned to do the 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 featurettes to do the commentaries to actually get all those things together and then press the right amount because mm -hmm. you never know. You you kind right. of look at what you've done previously, but the, the market can change and then you can be surprised too. So you don't want to not have enough product to actually service everyone when you come out. But at the same time too, you're realizing these are not just, you know, DVDs you can make for 90 cents. These are, you know, 26 page booklets. Right. And it, in our first release, we have actu actually two Blu-rays in each um Case so that it, it's it's a lot and you want to get it right you want to make sure that you know you're you're ordering and you're not able to um go back to the distributor and say we need two more weeks to get more product so we're just trying to time everything correctly and then get the cadence down so we're ahead of schedule and not behind schedule because that's always the most challenging thing is when you get close to street date and people go on to the internet and if it's not available to ship in 24 or 48 hours uh, you lose sales. Can we hone in on something that you just said there? I, I want to highlight the investment from you, the the cost of, I don't need specific numbers, but there is a, a misconception again among some fans and collectors that, well, it costs them 30 cents to make this. That is not the case with what you're doing, right? No. I mean, you've got to pay the contributors. You've got to pay, you're paying for restoration time. It's, it's I, tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. So really, um, the reality is you have to do a lot more than just sell your wares on, on Blu-ray. You have to go out there and get onto streaming channels. You have to license your stuff. Um, and then you have to make sure that you've got enough in the reserve to pay to do the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, I also noticed that to your point about putting it in different places, this uh, there's there seems to be a concerted effort across the board to put content on YouTube. There's the blog, there's uh, the DVD and Blu-ray releases. It really seems like you're trying to catch people in a variety of different places. Oh, for sure. I mean, our, our goal ultimately is to have as many platforms with our movies and original productions. Um, probably at some point in 2024, we will introduce either a streaming channel 
or some form of an app that includes not just our library, but probably a combination of some of our, you know, close, friendly archive partners that we work mm -hmm. with. Um, and I think, again, you know, there's room for this. Um, I look at the past few years and my experience with, you know, working for another company, working kind of within the industry, you know, kind of a cog in the wheel. Um, there's there's a, a huge amount of deficiencies out there. Um, and I think it comes down to the people who are in programming and who work at these media companies. Um, in many cases, they don't care about legacy film. Um, they're looking for something that's gimmicky or, you know, this whole thing with NFT or the, the latest craze. You know, it, it's ludicrous. Yeah. Well, what what can we do? What can the fans do to support this? Support us by going on to Film Masters, read the editorial that gets updated weekly with some of our great contributors, uh, a huge range of different subjects, including what's new in home video, where we talk about new releases, not just from Film Masters, but from other similar companies like Kino Lorber and VCI and my friend Kip Parker and Something Weird Video, what they've done in conjunction with other boutique labels. So ultimately, we're all in this sort of boat together. We're all fans of genre film or deep catalog titles, and it's not the mainstream. And, and, and ultimately, we need one another to support it so boutique labels can thrive and survive. That's very well said. Before I wind down and let you go, is there anything that you wanted to cover that we haven't touched on? No, just that. I think we're at a really interesting point in the industry where there's an opportunity collectively to get a lot out, to go in and say, you know, what's available? Let's work together to get things scanned into 2K, 4K, and encourage these companies that are making huge investments to keep releasing these titles. And ultimately, it's going to help for preservation purposes, it's going to help to introduce a younger audience to classic film and cinema, and it's going to be way more interesting than watching left or right news cycle. And there you go. That's ain't that the truth? Uh, I'm really excited about it. I think that we are. Uh, I think the boutique Blu-ray market and just the film buff scene right now is in such an interesting, thriving, healthy place. And the possibilities of the future really seem limitless. And I'm so excited that you're part of it and that you are lining up everything that you are. I'm just, I can't wait to see how, uh, what the next few months bring. So we should mention the first three titles, by the way, the first three titles have been announced. They're up for pre-order. Uh, we've got the giant, is it Gila? Do you pronounce it Gila monster? It is Gila, right? You know, I, I, <laughs> my whole life, I've called it the giant, the giant Gila monster, but it is okay. the giant Gila monster. Uh, that's a double feature with uh, the killer shrews, which is cool because you're preserving that. Now that's a pres preservation of a double feature. Absolutely. Uh, Beast from Haunted Cave with Ski Troop Attack, double feature. Oh, by the way, the uh, giant Gila or Gila monster is on September 26th. Uh, Beast from Haunted Cave is October 24th. And then your uh, previously mentioned the Scarlet Letter is uh, November 21st. So again, I'll put links in the description of this so people can click straight through and pre-order those. I'll put the links to the website. Um, and that's just the first three. And I cannot wait to see because I know the kind of stuff that you do. And I'm like, what in the world is coming? Let's just now? say if the universe lines up the way we're hoping, our December announcement will be mind blowing. All right. I'm prepared to have my mind blown. <laughs> uh, Mr. Hopkins, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you very much and keep up the good work. I love what you do.